All right, everyone, welcome back to Science and Application with Eric Helms, pronounced Say What? And this is episode five. We're going to discuss range of motion and hypertrophy. So, first off, let, let's talk about what the heck we're talking about. Uh, as you guys have probably seen, if you watch some bodybuilders train, uh, you will very frequently see them using a partial range of motion. Uh, if you were to have a discussion with some of them or, or listen to maybe them uh, talk on some type of media outlet, they'd often tell you that, hey, using this partial range of motion, I can keep constant tension on the muscle. Um, and this enables me to, uh, you know, feel a better pump. And, and get bigger, and that, that's their rationale. Um, if you talk to just your average bodybuilder who is not necessarily um, an avid reader of science or is not a muscle physiology guru type of guy, uh, they'll probably just base this on the feeling. You know, and it's certainly true that if you can kind of keep it right in that tension range, that kind of mid-range of motion, you do feel um, it a bit more throughout. It's something I've experienced myself in my 12 years of training. Um, and it's something I've, I've heard preached in the gym a lot. You know, don't use that bottom range of motion uh, on, 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 the, on the curls. Keep constant tension. Uh, and on your squats, don't lock out at the top. Keep that constant tension. Uh, constant tension, constant tension, constant tension. Um, and the real question is, is, well, does this have any basis outside of just the way it feels? Well, you could certainly make an argument that maybe this, is enha this enhances metabolic stress uh, by keeping constant tension on the muscle. Maybe you're approximating something like blood flow restriction training, uh, which has been shown to be pretty effective. And the idea there is that even though uh, using less load because you've really maximized metabolic stress, uh, you're, you're going to get uh, more, more of, a, of a hypertrophic response. Well, sure, maybe. But I think one thing to consider about this is that we know for sure that mechanical tension and progressive tension overload is one of the underlying or is the underlying mechanism uh, to, to muscle growth in response to training. Uh, and the other, you know, this is basically the Brad Schoenfeld uh, model. Uh, shout out to, to BS. And I love that acronym for your name, by the way, if you're watching, Brad. Just kidding. It's not bullshit. Um, this is an interesting way of looking at um, you know hypertrophy it's a, it's a cool model this model has changed over time and um, I would say this is a pretty good model based on the information we currently have however there is still um, argument within the community the scientific community about the role of muscle damage and metabolic stress uh, it's very difficult to disentangle uh, the muscle damage that occurs from training uh, from the actual hypertrophic effects. So it's very hard to design studies where uh, muscle damage is differentiated. But some of the ones where uh, this is at least partially accomplished or attempted, uh, some studies might suggest that the role of muscle damage um, is not necessarily uh, an intrinsic quality of hypertrophy. Um, it's, it's very difficult to answer that question, but I, I, I'm personally a skeptic uh, to the role of muscle damage and hypertrophy. That doesn't mean that's the only way it can be, that I wouldn't change my mind. Uh, but similarly, there's also disagreement around the role of metabolic stress and how that can impact hypertrophy and whether it is additive or um, simply is uh, another way to result in recruiting uh, high threshold motor units by going to failure or being in a partially fatigued state. Uh, and it, does it really just come down to recruitment and training muscle fibers? We aren't 100% sure, but what we are sure of is that mechanical tension and progressive overload uh, is the primary mechanism. And when you think about it in very practical terms, very just really basic terms, you're not going to get any damage or any metabolic stress if you don't lift the weights in the first place. So it's always good just to kind of reor reorder and reprioritize the way you think about the way you organize your training. So you wouldn't want to base your training completely around uh, metabolic stress or muscle damage. And I would say that fundamentally changing the way that you perform all your exercises to highlight either muscle damage or metabolic stress is probably getting the cart before the horse. So anyway, that's all theory. That's just, you know, the scientists and, and the bodybuilders discussing things and going, I don't know, does this make sense? Yes, yeah, but let's actually get into the data. Because fortunately, we don't have to speculate. We actually have a fair amount of research on this topic. So let's start with a cool study uh, where they did preacher curls. And uh, this was a study by Pinto et al. And it's called The Effect of Range of Motion on Muscle Strength and Thickness. Uh, I believe this was a 10-week study uh, where they had participants exercising twice per week, uh, doing bicep curls, and they moved through a linear periodization model. So they started with, I believe, uh, 20 rep max. 
and worked all the way up. I think they went 20, 15, 12, 10, 8, um, 8, 8 RM. And I might have that a little, a little wrong, but basically they worked from uh, lighter to heavier uh, loads. And this is the load that they could use for the range of motion they did, uh, meaning that the partial range of motion group, as you can see here, uh, they did about, oh, maybe half or two thirds of a full rep, um, were using heavier loads. Because typically if you use a partial range of motion, uh, you can lift heavier loads because you don't have to move it through some of the weaker uh, points in that range of motion. And then the other group, same program exactly, except they always used a full range of motion. And the most interesting findings here were that there was a trend, nearly significant, for the stats nerds out there, I believe it was P equals 0.07, um, nearly significant findings that a greater amount of hypertrophy in the arm was achieved by the full range of motion group. So, you know, this was basically a pretty well-matched study, you know, uh, you could do a, a poorly designed study on range of motion where you just use the same load in both groups and based it off of a full range of motion uh, as a percentage of 1RM and then just always have uh, one group, the partial range of motion group, using a load that was too light you know, for them or, or, or is easier within that specific parameters of that exercise. But in this study and the study that I'm going to present, they're always using uh, the equivalent load in terms of um, intensity of effort that they could use for that range of motion, which means typically the partial range of motion training is with heavier weights. Okay. Um, so even with that heavier load, something about going to a partial range of motion, um, which might decrease specific tension at different points in the in the muscle throughout the range of motion. Uh, it doesn't reach long muscle lengths, which might be related to muscle damage if that has an impact. Some combination of those factors resulted in less muscle growth uh, in the partial range of motion group. Now that's just a bicep curl. It's an isolated exercise. The next study is pretty interesting. Uh, this is called the impact of range of motion during ecologically valid resistance training protocols on muscle size, subcutaneous fat, and strength uh, by McMahon et al. And this was a study uh, where they did full leg exercise, full leg training sessions three days per week. And this included uh, free weights such as the barbell back squat, Bulgarian split squats, uh, machine exercises, and also body weight exercises. They had one unsupervised session at home. Uh, and it was eight weeks in length. Um, and it was interesting in that they essentially used um, just a, a maximal range of motion for both groups. So one group couldn't go past 50 degrees of knee flexion, and the other could go up to 90 degrees of knee flexion. So it was, again, a partial versus a full range of motion uh, training design. Uh, and then over the course of these eight weeks, uh, they found at the end that there was a greater cross-sectional area increase in the quads, specifically the vastus lateralis, in the full range of motion training group compared to the partial range of motion training group. So this seems to apply not just to the, the bicep, uh, but also to uh, the, the thigh in response to uh, multiple different uh, exercises performed with full and partial range of motion. Uh, they also did a little bit of, of strength testing here, but it was um, not necessarily with the exercises they performed. I believe it was isometric um, uh, testing, and I could be wrong there, or maybe they measured uh, maximal voluntary contraction. I can't remember, but I remember that it wasn't a like a 1RM test or a very basic test of strength. And I think the next study is quite interesting in that it looks at both hypertrophy and strength in a more practical measure. Uh, and this is a study done by Bloomquist et al. Um, called the effect of range of motion and heavy load squatting on muscle and tendon adaptations. So once again, similar kind of setup. You can see here from the picture that you've got uh, the, the very partial squat versus that, that just about meat depth uh, squat that you can see. Um, if you see closely, uh, the, the diagram here has 100 kg listed on one and 200 kg on the other. That's to represent that yes, you can lift a heavier load when you're not using a full range of motion. And interestingly enough, uh, in this study, while yes, it was the same findings, uh, the full range of motion group uh, found greater increases in total leg lean body mass and also uh, muscle thickness in the thigh, I believe. Um, besides that, they also found some interesting findings with strength. And this goes back to the specificity principle. Uh, the group that did the shallow squats, they got stronger at the shallow squats compared to the deep squat group. And the deep squat group got stronger at deep squats compared to the shallow squat group. So Again, it comes back to the fact that uh, hypertrophy is a quality of putting effective tension on muscles, which apparently is done better with a full range of motion, uh, while strength being 
uh, impacted by hypertrophy, it is also very much a neurological adaptation and a skill, uh, and you will gain uh, strength at the specific ranges of motion that you train with. So uh, for all you powerlifters out there, if, if you want to get stronger at squats, uh, full range of motion squats certainly makes sense to at least be a, a good part of your program. So this interesting finding there, just to highlight the specificity of strength, but in general, folks, we know with a good amount of certainty that using a full range of motion seems to be better uh, for hypertrophy, even when you're training to failure as heavy as you can within that range of motion. So keep the range of motion there, train hard, train smart, and train with good form. And until next time, this is Eric Helm signing out.